Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us today. We're excited to share with you some exciting data on the performance speed of Decision's no-code automation platform. Who's speaking today? On the other side of this webinar screen, we have Will Pedersen. Will is our Vice President of Customer Experience at Decisions. He leads the customer success, training, documentation, solutions, and support teams. Basically, anything that has anything to do with our customers, Will leads that, that team. Will has an intimate knowledge of our product and will be sharing the data today. Say hey, Will. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm Chase Macri. I'm the events manager on the marketing team, and I will be our host. Before we get started, some brief housekeeping. Uh, we'd love for this webinar to be interactive. Uh, I'm sure you joined today with questions that you hope will answer. So please feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat function in Zoom to submit any questions you have at any time, and we'll seek to answer them as they come in. So Will, uh, what are we doing here today? You know, what is our goal? Yeah, thanks, Chase. So the goal here is to um, do something we have always been uh, not great at, which is provide really detailed performance numbers for different types of designs and decisions and show how those designs handle um, uh, under volume. We'll, we'll talk about the different test scenarios we ran, the architecture of the tests, and of course, the data for those. This is going to be primarily focused on backend testing, you know, rule engine, uh, workflow engine. We don't, that we, we will be doing another series of these uh, focused on like uh, concurrent user or front end user tests, but these are exclusively back end um, uh, performance numbers, rules, flows, message queues, file handling, things of that nature. There's four categories of tests we're going to run. We're going to run API tests. We're calling decisions as an API endpoint in a variety of ways, and then looking at the throughput as we um, do a, a large number of concurrent users, um, how decisions can transform from or to uh, like Excel CSV or Excel files, like turning Excel files into lists or turning lists into Excel files. We're going to look at the performance of some of the different external database integrations as well as some of the performance for the different um, processing options or processing types available in our message queue, um, in our message, in, in, in our specifically our RabbitMQ, but in our message queue uh, model or module. So if we start with API tests here, um, let's talk a bit about our test setup so everyone knows what we're doing. So this is a diagram of some kit that we've got, we, we have in our, in our world headquarters. And what we're doing is we've hardwired together three Windows servers. You can see some of the details of those Windows servers here. We've got a decision server on the left-hand side, and we have a J, two JMeter servers. Now, JMeter is a third-party application that allows us to do high-volume HTTP testing. And we're using that as the concurrent user generator, if you will. And that allows us to run, what we're doing is we're running 250 threads or sort of simulated users on each JMeter server so that at any, uh, all the data we're gonna walk through is a decision server serving up 500 simultaneous users. And you can see that this decision server um, is um, from a core count perspective is right in line with our production um, re recommendations. It's a little bit over our production spec for memory, but none of the tests we're talking about are impacted by memory at all. They are all focused on the CPU. So if we go into the next slide here, let's talk a bit about the rules uh, or the, the tests that we're going to run. We're going to cover some statement rules, seeing the difference in performance between a single or a multi, -phrase, uh, multi excuse me, multi-phrase rule. I wanted to say phase there. We're gonna look at some differences in truth tables based on row count, based on columns, as well as comparing and contrasting the execution uh, of a normal versus an external truth table. And then we're also gonna look at flows. We're gonna see what and how fast we can return empty flow results, flows with some simple in-memory steps like add steps, as well as what the impact of database calls to our flows are and what we can do using caching to alleviate some of that, um, some of that constraint and then reach back up to some of those high numbers we see um, in our empty flow tests. So let's talk about the first two tests we're gonna we'll focus on, which are our rule tests here. So we're gonna run a single phrase rule and a multi-phrase rule. So here's a single phrase rule, first number greater than second number. 
very simple rule for us. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see we've just copied that same phrase 20 times. And we're just running the same check. Now, just to be clear, we're not trick. There's no trickery here. It is running every check for every phrase. It is not caching the result in any way. And we'll see that in some of the uh, the performance numbers here. So let's go ahead and look at our statement rule results. So uh, again, we've got 500 concurrent users hitting a single decision server. And what we see here is the difference. Our red line is our single phrase and our blue line is our multi-phrase rule. And you can see our, our x-axis is our core count. And so what we've done is we found a way to um, disable in Windows OS the, 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 the cores that the operating system, the Windows server is using. And because we can do that, we ran tests on one, two, four, and eight cores. And you can see that, that, uh, that sort of throughput. We're looking at the number of message the throughput per second as reported by the JMeter application. And so at our top end for a single phrase rule, we're doing 16,500 rules per second with 500 concurrent users. And for our 20 phrase rule, we see a slight decrease, but not much considering the, the, the added complexity of that, that multi-phrase rule down to 15,740. Now this is on a single server. So at first you see, um, that adding, that doubling our core count from one to two and from two to four really um, uh, leads to a, an increase in the performance. But you can see it's a bit of a, uh, an increase, but not as, um, not as drastic between four and eight. The, we'll, talk some, we'll talk more at the end of this about how to calculate single server performance versus multi-server performance. But um, you know, we've got a single decisions application uh, to the question that's being asked, I can see it pop up. The, the, the averages on the right-hand side are just the average of the, um, the, two, the two numbers you see. So what's the average throughput for single versus multi-phrase here? The average between 16 and 15, so to speak. Uh, um, so that's that. You, know, you can see we've, we've often, we always talk about how performant the rule engine is. And, and I think that this really um, speaks true. A deci single decision server, with our normal production spec, can it service 16,000 rules per second under you under 500 uh, 500 concurrent user load. Yeah, I see that. Um, so it's under kind of standard specs, and then the results here for like one core, two cores, up to eight cores. Like, is eight cores the limit, or or can you go higher than that? Yeah, you can go up to 32 cores for a decision server. So we didn't uh, test up to that, but I think you can use the. Uh, you should be able to. Um, and we'll talk about some capacity planning here later on. Take this and turn it into a capacity planning function. You know, you can, you know that eight cores can give you X, and you know that you can put 32 cores on a server, and that you can run effectively a limitless number of servers behind a single load balancer to give you to scale horizontally. Hmm. So, so that's our that's our statement rules. So let's talk a bit about some of the truth tables that we're going to run. So here we have a truth table with a single string match column, followed by an, uh, our truth table with 10 uh, columns on the next, uh, the next slide there. Yeah, so single string, single match versus 10 match. And then the next one would be an external data truth table that is also a single string match. So if we start to look at some of the test results that we see for truth tables, we see a more interesting story here. And so what we see is uh, on the left-hand side, we see the throughput per second um, based on the row count. So uh, in our previous statement rule examples, we were looking at one verse 20 and how that affects this. Now what we're actually doing is adding an additional variable. And what we're looking at is the number of rows in the truth table uh, as well as on the right-hand side, the number of rows and the number of columns or the match columns in that truth table. And so you can see right now on the left-hand side, uh, on our eight-core server, a 100-row truth table can service up about 8,900 um, truth table executions per second. Now, just to be clear, we've architected these truth tables to return the last match, and that ensures that the truth table executes through every row. So on our 10,000 row example there, where we can see a significant decrease 
every truth table is scanning through all 10,000 rows, looking for every match and returning the last match. What we do, what we would see are the best practices as we would build our truth tables would be to move the most likely scenarios to the top. And almost always, but not exclusively, we would be doing first match, which means that we should rarely ever hit a 10,000. We should rarely ever have to go through the entirety of the truth table. But if we do, um, we can see, we can get some idea about our throughput per second numbers. On the right hand side, you can see the same test run, but with our 10 string match. So we're doing, for example, in the middle there, a thousand rows with 10 columns. So there's a significant amount of, um, of business logic being processed per second in these charts here. If we go to the next slide, you'll see what we've done is, is, is graph out uh, the eight core number of the single match versus the 10 string match column. And you can see that at 100 rows, they're effectively equivalent, like they're very close. But that addition of those 10 columns uh, creates a, a significant difference in, in performance at 1,000 rows, where at about 10,000 rows, they, sort of, they, they reach a similar performance profile. So the story here is the, the complexity of your truth table drives the performance of that truth table. And we'll, drive, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that same theory or you know, the same narrative repeated here in some of these following slides. Complexity is um, the simple things are extremely fast. We control the, the, the performance of these things based on the pieces that we add, the number of columns, the particular columns. So we are only doing string matching here. We are not doing any other types of matching. Um, we were doing a, a number uh, match in our previous um, statement rule example. So we're not looking at how different rule verbs affect performance, just how the row counts of our truth tables, as well as the number of columns in those truth tables affect performance. Yeah, I so, want to jump in here real quick because there was another please. question that, that came in through the Q&A. Is there any chance that decisions are seeing that there are 20 instances of the same phrase and perhaps optimizing or, or condensing that in some way? As much as I want to say yes, the answer to that is no. It is running all of those um, executions. Great. For better or worse, right? I mean, it, it, uh, uh, it would be wonderful if we were, um, but as of right now, um, uh, we're hitting those numbers, running all of those executions. We could, we could show that by having uh, 20 phrases, each of which is checking a different string value and we would, get, uh, we would get the same results. There's no caching going on on the statement rule, uh, the statement rule data. If we, Chase, if we move to the next slide, now what we're doing is we're comparing our single string regular truth table to our uh, single string match external truth table. And this starts to tell a really interesting story here. Um, it makes sense that our previous truth table, the number of columns would affect the performance as there are um, 10 times Actually, there's 10 times 10 as many um, per, you know, executions required um, given the, the row count to um, column count. And what we can see is, of course, we're seeing the same number here of 8,900 for our single string match. But if we look at our external data truth table, we're up near 14,000 at 100 rows. And that number stays really, really consistent. Um, and you'll notice, unlike the traditional truth table, we actually show you the execution details for a 100,000 row truth table. So if we move to the next slide here, where we compare and contrast, uh, again, we're overlaying our eight core test for external data truth tables uh, in blue. And then in red, we see our, uh, looks like our legend slightly mismatched there, I apologize. The blue line is our, um, is our external data single match truth table. The red line is our traditional truth table, a regular truth table on single match. And you can notice the performance difference here. Now, external data truth tables were introduced um, to help uh, both from a design and runtime experience to improve performance. And you can see that is, is clearly shown at a thousand rows. An external data truth table is almost three times as fast. Now, there, there's of course a trade-off here in terms of rule verb complexity. So an external data truth table handles volume of rows uh, or volume of data much more efficiently but you trade off that by having less or not having available all of the sets of rule verbs that you do on a traditional truth table. Now, it's very rare for us to see a thousand row truth table. In some of the data that we've gathered, the average truth table is somewhere between 20 to 40 rows. And so we're well under even that, um, that 
initial result at a hundred row of for our traditional truth table uh, that we've seen before. But I think what we've done is we've added this external data truth table. We added this in version six originally, uh, and we've done a lot of work to optimize that. And what we'll be doing over the coming, say, 12 or 18 months is moving a lot of that optimization that we've done in external data truth tables back into regular truth tables to improve the performance of our normal truth table function. So really good story to tell about external data truth tables, really good story to tell about our, our normal truth tables, and then also informing some additional work that our product team needs to do to bridge the gap between those two so that you have the same level of capability and, and, and throughput uh, for both. So that's, a, that, that's our truth table data. And so let's start talking about flows here. So we're gonna run, again, we're gonna do an example of us just calling an empty flow that returns no data. We're going to call a flow that has 10 math steps in it. These are um, 10 add steps that are feeding their outputs to each other. Um, so they are actually doing real calculations. If we could move to the next slide, Chase, please. Um, uh, so here's an example. This is the flow we're running with 10 steps. Uh, following this, we're gonna, we're gonna show the performance of a flow that's making a database call. This is an external database call. Uh, and then following that, we're gonna run that same flow, but we're gonna use um, decisions caching to prevent us from needing to hit that database connection every time. And so we'll be able to look at the results of that. So jumping into our flow results here, if we look at our flow results for an empty flow versus our 10 step flow, you'll see this matches really closely to the rule engine numbers that we were looking at before for our single and our multi-phrase rules. Now this shouldn't be shocking it's not shocking to me, but it's not. it shouldn't be shocking because the rule engine is the flow engine. The way to think about a rule engine is that the rule engine is a design time experience to allow you to edit your edit flows uh, in a very constrained uh, edit experience. But under the, the rule engine is the flow engine at the end of the day. All of our optimizations that we've rolled into the flow engine are available for free to the rule engine as they are at the end of the day, one single engine. So we can again see that same growth as we add more core count, um, and we can see at you know at our at our recommended production spec or a recommended minimum production spec. I might want to say that slightly different. We've, we're doing about fifteen thousand empty flows per second, and thirteen thousand four hundred flows with ten steps. Now, if we move to our next chart here, what we're going to see is uh, a decrease in performance. Let's start with the red line here. So. What we see here is this is the perform this is the throughput, and I'll just for and again this is 500 concurrent users calling a sim a single decision server under uh, different core constraints. So we've gone from 15,000 down to 3,400 with the addition of a single database step. So this this a flow can only be called as fast as the slowest step in it. Um. But if we look at the blue line, what we've done is we've used decisions outcome caching. We've cached that step. And we can cache that at the user or the application server level. And we can time bound that cache to be as long or as short of a duration as fits our business requirements. And you can see while we're not back up to our 15,000, we are much closer to the, um, the, the 10 step execution than we were. And in fact, if we look at the next slide, what we've done is we've laid our 10 step flow, our cache database step flow, and our non cache database step flow all together. And you can see the increase as we add more cores, of course, um, but you can see the delta between in memory and database and cached database uh, execution here. You know, the, the flow is, the, is as fast or as slow as the pieces of it are. And so it's the design of the flow that drives performance more than it is the capability of the flow engine to do work on your behalf. Is there a trade-off here though, versus doing one versus doing the cast one? I imagine there's some complexity you'd lose like your previous example or what, what, was, what is the reason why you'd want to use cast or could use cast? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, the cache question is more of a function of your data than it is a capability question. So it assumes that there, your data is static in some way or the calls are consistent in some way. Now, we can cache on, just to be a little bit technical here, what we do is we cache on the input of, the, uh, of that step. So we can have custom cache keys based on the input. 
But what we do is that means for the duration of that time, the duration of that cache that we've established, we are not going to actually go request that data. So we need to be confident as the designers that that data is static enough so that we can know that for five, for 15 minutes, or for, you know, for 12 hours, that that data hasn't changed or is, is uh, not likely to change much or if at all. So it's really a question of what's the volatility of the data that you're requesting. Now we're using a database step here, but this could easily be an API or a REST service integration. There's nothing about the database step that allows or makes cache available. Decisions allows you to cache any step at all. Um, it doesn't have to be even an external service. Great. So uh, that really concludes our API tests, right? Um, we, it, was, it was really wonderful running that. We learned a lot about JMeter, about JMeter's limitations, decisions, um, you know, constraints and limitations. And um, it, it took us a long time to figure out, you know, we, we, we had to realize we needed multiple test servers given the volume of work that decision was handling on our behalf. So uh, that was really, that was a, it was a lot of fun learning how to use JMeter at volume and, uh, and plotting out some of those numbers. But let's moving, let, we, we go ahead and move on here. Let's talk about file handling. The file, hand, the file handling tests are gonna be slightly different um, than um, some of our other, the, the tests we just walked through. Again, we're gonna talk, we're gonna show you the performance of, a, of different steps in bringing in Excel or CSV data into a flow, mapping it to a list in some way, making it available for, for mapping, as well as our ability to generate a CSV from a list of data. So if we look at the next slide, you could just see an example of the CSV file we've used for these tests. And this was, a, this was the CSV of different row counts that we imported. And this is the, and then once we had that data imported that we exported into, um, uh, that we exported back into a CSV. And as before, if we click to the next slide, you can see some examples. So here's our list to CSV, we're fetching data. And then in, th in this example, we're not looking at, we're not using J meters throughput per second as our, um, uh, as our data, we're actually, we put a this log step on either side of the list to CSV step. And that's because we didn't want to, we didn't want to have the fetch uh, sort of influence the, the timing here. And then on the, the next slide, you'll see it's just a single step, which is our CSV to list mapping uh, step. So let's look at the results here. So now, unlike before we were looking at throughput, this is, these are duration tests. How long does it take us in this example to uh, import either through the for each uh, Excel CSV, the import runtime, or the, Im the import Excel CSV standard step. There's sort of two flavors of that step. How long does it take us to import a 10,000, uh, a 100,000, a million, or a 10 million line CSV? And you can see here that at our slowest, uh, you know, with our for each step, uh, it can take us quite a while, right? 812 seconds to do a million line, to do 10 million line CSV or as fast as 136 seconds. These, all this data is in milliseconds. So our import Excel CSV step is our most performant Excel import step. And it can, it can turn a CSV into an object list for of 10 million strong in uh, just about a minute and a half, a little bit over a minute and a half. You'll see the same pattern where we're looking at duration numbers with, um, uh, with column charts and our throughput charts as, uh, as line charts, just as a note. And if we move on to the next step, here you can see what it looks like for us to turn a list CSV at different core counts here. And so we have a, we have a, we have a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million objects in a database. We need to fetch those objects and we need to convert that data into a CSV. And you can see at eight cores, we're doing that in a little over four seconds. Now, again, this isn't the fetch, it's only the conversion. So you're definitely talking about a little bit of time to fetch, you know, a million records from, from the data store, but the conversion operation itself for a million rows is it's just a, it's just a tick over, um, uh, a tick over four seconds. That's all of the file handling work that we've done testing for. Um, those are usually the most um, heavy, those are usually the ones that uh, CSV to list or list to CSV are usually heavy operations that we, we oftentimes have a lot of requirements for throughput for. There's of course, tons of other file handling options or, or designs available in the tool, creating PDFs, merging PDFs, adding images and other sorts of things to PDFs. Um, we're gonna try to do some performance testing around those in the future. 
um, but we started with just a few tests around our ability to import and or export CSV data respectively. So try not to take forever here to give everyone an opportunity to, to ask some questions. Let's look at DB integrations. We're gonna, we're gonna run um, our data, we're gonna run the same sets of uh, database steps. We're gonna insert data to an external database. We're gonna update data in an external database and we're gonna bulk insert data into an external database. And we're going to do that in a low latency, in a high latency test environment and look and report on the results. So um, if we go to the next slide, let's just talk a bit about how we contrive this. Now, this is the same uh, three sets of servers. We're only using two of them that we use for our API tests. And what we've done is we've converted or installed SQL on one of the JMeter servers. And we have a hardwire setup on the left-hand side, which we're calling our low latency. So these are, these are networked together through you know, whatever the current version of Cat5 is. And on, on the right-hand side, we've, we've made the connection between the decision server and the external server happen over Wi-Fi. Now, of course, that's a contrivance, um, but it was the simplest way we could think through to, to sort of arbitrarily enforce a low latency connection. And let's talk a bit about the, just review a quick, uh, quickly review what those diagrams look like. So if we move to the next um, uh, slide here, I think we might've had that slide a little bit early, unfortunately, Chase. Um, this is a flow where we're doing our insert. Um, we're building up a list of objects and we're passing them into the insert step, following by us looping through an update step to update data in that external database. And then on the right, hand, and then following that is our same same design as our insert, but now we're using a batch insert entities. So let's look at our results here. If we look, uh, if we compare and contrast high latency versus low latency of insert versus update, the update step on the right hand side is significantly faster than our insert step, but the but it's not as different between the low and high latency um, tests are. The um, the if we look at our insert step. Our high latency step to do 10 million records takes nearly four hours. It's, a, um, it's an eternity. But even on low latency, it's about you know, uh, 15 minutes to do all of that work on our behalf. And if we look on the right-hand side, we can see it's about in a low latency for updating. It's about 202 hours and 15 minutes uh, and about 15 minutes for, um, uh, for the updating as well. So um, uh, you know, not great numbers, right? Uh, the insert step um, takes much too long uh, for us. In fact, I, I think I misstated. It's not fi it's 15 minutes for our update. It's about 38 minutes for our insert step. But let's go and compare and contrast our insert to our bulk insert step, right? On the left-hand side, we're just restating our normal insert step there. And you can see um, in our low latency, it's like I said, it's about 38 or 40 minutes. And then look at the performance difference in our low latency test for our bulk insert step. Right, just like we saw that the database steps can affect the throughput of our flows, the particular steps affect the performance of our flows in the same way. If we have a, an insert step is fit for inserting a small amount of records to an external database, bulk insert uh, is, is fit for handling large data sets. So if you have a large data ingestion problem, not ingestion, a large data write problem, you need to be looking at bulk insert, right? Like the performance difference is substantial here. And in fact, if we look at that just at, uh, on the next slide where we've lo looked at them together, you can see that the bulk insert step, regardless of a low or high latency environment, is extremely, uh, is extremely fast. So it's important to pick the right step for the right job. Um, you know, we have lots of steps in the toolbox. Some of them are, uh, like we saw with the for each example, are, are fit for small data and they work and they're easy to use. But others are require maybe a little bit more thoughtfulness or design, but they, they sort of reward us for that thoughtfulness and that design with humongous or sort of very, very high performance numbers. So that's, that's our database tests. You know, it's really a story about the performance of bulk insert and how much latency can affect your, um, uh, can affect your 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 real world performance. With, when we're talking about any sort of external system, latency is not something that we is something we need to consider. And the only way for us to really confirm that is to test in production like environments as much as possible. And that takes us to our last test section here. I know I've been talking for a while, so I do apologize. Which is 
showing how quickly we can process messages off of a queue. Now, um, I don't have a diagram to show the, the example here, but I will say these numbers are, uh, are awesome. Like, I mean, even higher than I expected. Uh, the architecture here um, is we have a RabbitMQ server installed on the same on, on the decision server. So this is about as a low latency of an environment as you can get. These are really probably close to max theoretical numbers as possible given, given that setup. But what we want to look at is the difference between the two least types and the two get types for our message queues, um, uh, message queue modules. Uh, really quickly, just to give some insight, because this one, unlike the others, does really require the concept uh, of, uh, of understanding how our queues work. You know, message queue modules are the best way to get vol low, you know, volume or batch work done by a decision server. And the reason is because each decision server spins up these things we call active, uh, uh, these message handler flows. That's what you see in the, the red there with the number four. And then as you add more nodes into your production cluster, you double or triple or quadruple, right? Equal to the number of nodes in your cluster, the amount of work you can process. And so it's a wonderful way to ensure that you're distributing work across the entirety of a cluster. One thing that some of those tests show, like the file handling tests or the database tests, they don't really call out well, is those things are happening on a single server. That work's not being shared in a cluster, even if there is a cluster um, available. I'm sorry, my monitor just shut down. So let me bring zoom window over. Ah, there it goes. Sorry about that. So let's look at some of the results here. And, um, and, and so here we're seeing, uh, this is specific to that rabbit MQ at our eight cores, and we're running 10 active flows. So 10 open, so sort of 10, we're processing 10 messages in parallel. And we're, it's an empty flow, right? We're not doing any work in the flow. We're just trying to see how quickly can we pull messages off of a queue. And you'll notice the difference here, just like we saw with some of the other pieces where, you know, number of columns um, determines performance or um, the particular steps used, right, is the, the setting, the biggest thing that drives performance here is the, the, the message queue processing type. And on the left-hand side, you see lease, and on the right-hand side, you see get. And the way you should think about that x-axis is going from like completely redundant, that message will always get processed no matter any errors that occur, all the way to the right-hand side, which is, which is possible to lose messages. So it's a question of what your business requirement is. You know, if you have like, um, if you're doing something that you can't drop, no matter what happens, then you need to be looking at a lease or lease with expire. Um, if you have the ability to lose some of these things, this is a high volume, maybe something like an internet of things type use case that are all posting heartbeat message data to a queue, well, you get a lot of performance from get and get and remove. Uh, I mean, honestly, when we put these numbers together, I, I, I was shocked at how many messages. This is, this is RabbitMQ reporting the throughput per second from a queue that we've loaded up with millions and millions of messages. And we have pointed 10 active, uh, you know, these active form, active uh, uh, queue handler flows, excuse me, 10 flows processing um, in parallel can run nearly you know, 135,000 messages per second. So I mean, those are just some uh, kind of incredible numbers. So yeah, these are vastly different than, than, you know, it's pretty similar to the other example you showed where one was pretty low and this one's pretty high. Um, like, is there, is there another difference as to why lease and get have, have such different res results? Yeah, Lisa actually makes a call back to the to the message queue server to say, "Hey, I've processed this message." So instead of pulling a message and processing it, it pulls a message, it processes it, and the queue handler flow, when it hits its end step, sends a call back to Rabbit and says, "Hey, I fully processed this thing. You can go ahead and remove it from the queue." And that is just a much slower pattern, regardless of what software system you might be building your queue handler logic in, decisions or 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 something else. And to your point before, almost like if if the data that you, if you're, if you're less likely to get in trouble with losing data or having an issue, like get and remove would be much faster process. Like, absolutely. Can you, can you talk to that a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, you know, we have, um, we have customers who, um, you know, receive um, heartbeat data, like health, health data every two minutes from elevators. Now that data is important, but likely can be lost. Like if they lose a heartbeat data, you know, they, the, um, it doesn't actually, 
cause the system to not function as expected. And so they're using, you know, get, uh, I'm not sure if it's get or get and remove and to process hundreds of millions of messages a day, right? And they've got three decisions clusters running uh, these message queue handlers on some really big decision servers. And they're just processing an enormous amount of messages. I mean, it's just a huge, it's a volume rule engine use case. That's, um, that's just really neat. Yeah, interesting. Um, there's another question that kind of came through while you were talking. Um, seems to be related somewhat to what we, the last set of tests we went through. But the question is, do, can you discuss the rule collection filter step and use versus uh, run flows for list with a rule inside? It says it seems like the latter has better performance. The collection filter step seems to take a lot of time versus other patterns. Yeah, so look, if you look at this chart here, this kind of tells a story. You've got 10 active flows. There's 10 flows working in parallel off of this queue. A coll rule collection filter step is running on a single server on a single thread. It can, it's not processing those messages in parallel at all. A run flow for list implies parallel processing. You're asking the workflow engine well, thank to you open up multiple time. workflow this engines. You. You're passing um, a collection again, in, will, uh, and then Pedersen, you're having that work and I'm the vice um, done in parallel. Now you can make the decision. argument that we should so just make our rule collection filter do that by default. And, and that's an interesting sort of product suggestion. But um, it, it's because uh, it's because of the difference between single threaded and multi threaded work, work uh, you know, uh, work or or processing. That, that's the biggest difference. You can run four or eight or twelve or twenty four, you know, um, run flow for list processes in parallel. But you can also do too many, right? You can run, you can ask for two hundred, and you can slow your server down more, and it would take longer. So. Um, it's really the difference. Um, of course, decisions isn't the only software application that's like highly focused on moving work, you know, making work parallel to increase throughput. But but that's the specific reason why that specific example would be faster or slower. It's that our rule collection filter step is not does not have any concept of parallel processing. It has to move through each item individually before it gets to the next item. It's a good question. Yeah. So lastly, well, and we're probably not, oh, sorry, Chase, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, I was going to reiterate mostly the same thing. Like we've walked through a lot of examples. Um, and so I'm just curious, like how we can talk about um, putting these things together. I mean, you talk about rules, flows, database integrations, file handling, throughput. We showed a lot of data, you know, help me understand and our audience understand like how we can put this together for capacity planning. Yeah, so let's let's briefly talk about capacity planning to wrap this up here. So uh, it requires you to understand two concepts and, and or three concepts. You need to understand vertical scaling, which is adding more compute resources to a, to a specific server in this example. Horizontal scaling, which is adding more servers and clustering, which is the fact that multiple servers can work in concert together in decisions. So if we move to the next slide, just to reiterate, this is what a cluster looks like for decisions. There's a load balancer, which is some other application that sends requests down and that uh, to a, a cluster of decision servers. All, de all decision servers in a cluster share a same, share, you know, share a shared database. Uh, and then there, you can have two or many um, servers behind a load balancer all serving up requests. So this, if we move to the, now that we sort of understand what a cluster is, at least in, uh, at a high level, it's two or more decision servers working behind a load balancer together. And we pair that with vertical scaling, which is the ability to add more compute resources to each um, server. Like we saw, you can move your, you know, rule or flow performance around by at, by moving from one to eight cores uh, significantly, right? The the specs of the server um, determine performance as much as if uh, probably not as much as, but um, the two biggest things that determine performance would be the, the specifications of the server, the hardware it's running on, and the design of that thing. We can put more compute resources into a decision server if we need to do more work. Here you can see on the left-hand side, you know, uh, that sort of, that, uh, that Y-axis, which says upgrade, that's adding more uh, cores, upgrading from an M4 and to an M4X large, or from a D4X, D4 regular to D4X large, those are probably bad things to say here. Those are just the, the skews of like Azure and AWS virtual machines. A decision server can use up to 32 cores. So if our use case requires more than 32 cores, then we need to start thinking about adding additional decision servers. 
um, we mostly add decision servers for redundancy in case one goes down, the other one's still up to serve requests. But every time, but we also get every time we add redundancy by adding servers, we gain capacity. And so here, you, we can we can e increase each individual server or add more servers. And the two, those are our two levers um, with that 32 core cap that help us do a plan. Um, and I think we have some math on the next slide that's um, kind of a, a capacity planning uh, in theory exercise, if you will. Yeah, and like before we even get there too, like a question just came up that I think we talked about a little bit, but just to reiterate, like your, the performance of decisions, this is about capacity, like how you design your flows, all the steps that are in them. If there's calls that go outside of decisions, that's gonna affect the overall performance, right? Yeah, correct. So we can, we like, let's assume we have a flow with a database call that takes a second. That means every flow cannot, can't be less than a second. Given the numbers we're looking at, we can see that it's a second plus a few milliseconds, right? To spin the workflow engine up, to copy it, to, to, to make the calls, to map the data, to do the work the workflow engine has to do. But it can't possibly be lower than a second. So the, the two options are to figure out how to make that database call faster and do more in parallel. Right. It's not that you can't you can't it's not that you can't increase the volume. It's just that your ability, your your sort of capacity model depends on the speed of each flow. And so if you can run 10,000 flows per second versus 3000, you're going to need less cores. You're going to need less servers to manage or to sort of um, to meet that that volume, that throughput requirement. You can you can parallelize to your heart's content. Right. If you have. Uh, if you have a database query that takes 40 seconds and you need to do 100 a second, well, you could quickly figure out how many, how you know, in, in, in this, so we'll walk through a math, the math here in a second, how much compute resources you'd need to run all that work in parallel. But for us, for as decisions designers, as people building these rule engine use cases or these batch processing use cases, it's the design that's the most important thing, right? A flow with a, you know, spending the time database indexing right, or figuring out if we can cache. Those are the really important questions because we can, we can earn a lot of performance and throughput by just ensuring our design is as, is as tight or as efficient as possible. So um, one call out here, these are all theoretical numbers. They're not theoretical, these are all real world numbers, but we never, you're never gonna run a flow that doesn't return data or that doesn't have any real steps in it, right? These are, these are very, these are, I'm admitting that these are contrived examples. Um, so we're going to use some, we're going to use some of these, like, um, these idealized numbers. Um, but the, the, you know, you're going to want to back these off given complexity here, right? Um, you're, you're going to, you're, you're going to get 7,500 rules a second, right? Because you're going to do a bunch of if else then checks, or you're going to have some database calls in there, or there's competition for resources because you have two other projects running on a server. There's a, there's a lot that goes into capacity planning. But realistically, it, we could think about it. I just walk through this simple example. You know, we have a business requirement to run 130,000 rules a second, given given you know, given the volume here. You know, our data shows we can run 15,000 rules per second at eight cores. So if we divide, you know, 130,000 calls by 15,000, we, we get 8.6. We can figure out that that gives us 60. That we need 69. It's like 68.6. 69 cores needed. Um, to process that volume. We've got a 32 core per server max. So if we divide 32 into 69, we get a little over two servers worth of need to hit that number. Um, and I'll just, all sorts of qualifications here, right? Other work, you know, do you have users and processing occurring? Um, this is laboratory testing stuff, but this is, this, is, this is how you capacity plan. You figure out your volume, you try, you, you have your team go or you go and you design and try to get your flow as uh, or your main process as efficient as possible. Figure out how much you can process through it using uh, the tools we use are all off the shelf. JMeter is a, a is a freeware tool. You can you should learn how to use it if you don't. It's a wonderful application. And then you can start figuring out what your volume is, and then that um, or what your your throughput would be, and then that throughput allows you to calculate out based on that volume what your compute capacity might be. And that's it. I apologize if I was talking much too fast. I have a tendency to do that. Um, but yeah, any other, Chase, any other questions from anybody? I'll pause well, for Well, one thing about coffee. this too is, is that we did record it. So if there is anything anyone missed, they'll be able to go back and review the recording. We'll, or we'll post this on our website sometime very soon. 
Um, and for anyone that's interested, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me. It's, it's uh, chase at decisions.com or will, will at decisions.com with any questions um, through email. And I'm also happy to share this recording. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, we're, we we want to be helpful and informative here. Um, so yeah, we have some some more time, like another 10 minutes or so until we're out right of this hour. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, please. You can, um, you can raise your hand. I can bring you up on stage and have you speak to the group or you know drop them in the chat or in the Q&A box one way or the other. Well, I guess the question that I have, and it's more from a, from a, a construction standpoint. I mean, you mentioned that this is mostly back end kind of testing. Like, yeah. how? Uh, what do you have in mind for the next set of tests that you might do? That'll be more front end. Like, what does that look like? You know, Chase, that's a great question. I wish I had an answer easy at hand. It that's a non trivial question, right? Like, that is not something that's decision specific. But doing volume concurrent user testing for web applications is. Um, is an interesting problem to solve for. So we're looking at some applications that do like that use Selenium to do like uh, allow you to run a lot of concurrent users against things. These are tools like Ninja, Ninja Load, Neo Load, things of that nature. Um, we're kind of looking at some of those applications to see if we can't get some of those numbers together. Um, but yeah, it, 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 the yeah, we're looking long TLDR. We're looking at some other applications to see if they can help us with that because that is a that is a tough ask. All right, folks. Well, um, last call. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, shoot us an email. Look out for our next webinar. We post them at decisions.com slash events. On our events page, you can see anything we have there. And we have a few coming up next year. You know, early in January, we'll be looking at our, our possibilities team or solutions team, some of the applications they've been developing within the decisions platform. We like to call them quick hitters. They're, they're usually small footprint type of applications that solve a very specific problem. A lot of financial services focused applications. There'll be some for, for other industries and, and other interests as well coming down the pike next year. So that's our first webinar in January. And you know later in the year, we'll be looking to do some more in-person training. And many of you came to some of our Submerse events that we had back in September and in December. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, we'll be doing some more of those coming in 2023 as well. I see another question uh, from Buckley. Thank you very much. Uh, can a decision servers be virtualized in a way that we could add both horizontally or vertically um, to scale on the fly? Yeah, thanks for the question. So yes, sort of. You know, you can't, not vertical scaling, but um, in one of the, the biggest thing that we did in version eight is allow decisions to run inside of a Docker container. And the reason we did that is at least is there's two main reasons. One is, you know, a lot of DevOps teams, a lot of your IT teams, they prefer container deployment these days for lots of reasons. So we needed to support that, but we also needed to support to we needed to support dynamic scalability. So the uh, but that doesn't what we do is you can we showed that cluster example where you can add more container, or you add more servers behind a um uh, behind a load balancer. And containers in V8 allow you to scale your compute to the, to the demands needed instead of capacity planning for your peak volume like we were kind of doing there a moment ago. So one of the future performance webinars we'll have and some of the data we'll release is giving you an idea about um, how responsive and how quickly a container architecture you know, running decisions can respond to that. So you absolutely can, does require containers, which, which implies being on version eight, um, but you absolutely can. It, the only qualification there to your very specific question is it's not vertically scaling. Like you say, every container is four cores, and then you let an online, you let a Kubernetes, you let a container management software like Kubernetes, you know, say, okay, spin another one up, spin another one up, spin another one up, and it starts horizontally scaling, you know, out the wazoo to give you to meet the volume that you have. And so, there's there's really no limitation on on capacity there. Um, uh, or your your ability to support inbound inbound volume. So we're we, a lot more work to do there to provide some insight into how that works. Um, we've got a lot of documentation about how to set it up, maybe how to think about it. But um, if you have any questions about that, as Chase said, please reach out to us. We're we're happy to deep dive on those topics for you. We're we've got a lot of customers that are hungry to upgrade to version eight to get access to container based hosting. 
We got another question Jeez. here. Any comparison between V8 running in an, uh, an II, IIS app pool versus container? Um, not yet, no. Um, uh, it looks like we're getting a, uh, a bit more performance given some, some quirks in .NET Core and Windows Server versus um, container-based performance given how we decisions use of GUIDs and the fact that .NET Core on Linux is not very efficient at generating GUIDs. So we've identified that there's a bit of, there's a performance gap there on Linux that we need to solve for. Um, and we're looking at doing that in a variety of ways. So that's kind of offset by the fact that it can then scale horizontally as much as you need. So um, um, not concrete numbers. We know that there's a performance difference. Uh, and we're working to to address that. So it's a really good question. We do know in version seven, version eight, you can run with or without IS. And so running without IS is uh, is faster. All of these tests are done um, in an embedded runtime uh, or embedded decisions uh, install. There is no IIS here, just a note. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We're really happy to be able to share some of this data. Looking forward to sharing some more in the future. Um, again, check our website. We have more events up on that page. Shoot us an email, will at decisions.com or chase at decisions.com. And please have a great day. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Appreciate the uh, appreciate you guys. Thanks. Have a great day.